record. Okay, now we are recording. Um, okay, so for anyone watching the video, sorry, I didn't press record properly. So we have already discussed focus and practice charts, but um, let's just have a roundup of what we've just talked about to review our feelings about it. Kit, two things from what we just talked about, please. Um, it was about like keeping your calm. Yeah, very and good. It's, it's actually kind of the end of it. Um, and also, like often the reward if they do something good. Excellent, yeah, and to praise the effort, not the outcome. Yeah, good. I didn't write that in, I should write that in. Devin? Sorry, what was the question? What were we talking about before? Before we actually read that thing, what were we talking about with charts and things? Can you just sort of summarise it? Um, <coughs> sorry, what specifically? Just anything? How practice charts and getting practice started can be helped by us, even though we're not there. Um, giving a warning before the practice mm -hmm. starts. Excellent. Um, and yeah, practice charts just helping the parent and the child know what they're doing. Yeah, very and good. Being organised. Yeah, exactly. So one of the main issues with practice is that the parents are kind of on the hoof and then the, the children pick up on that and then they get fed up because they feel like, well, why should I give you my time and energy when you're not doing it properly either? Um, excellent. Hannah? Any um, main things from what we were just talking about? I like the stopwatch idea. Mm -hmm. um, so stopping the clock um, each time the kid isn't engaged in the practice and then letting them know at the end of the half hour how, how long they actually spent on the violin and then trying to improve on that. Yeah. Um, use, and kind of behavioural, other behavioural things like using what they use at school, um, giving warnings before any naughty steps. Yeah. So the, um, yeah, so all of the practice help is under Parent Hub on suzukihub.com uh, under a section called Practice Help. So you can read all the handouts that we've got there and uh, practice charts. I can't remember if they are on the website actually, but you can email me if you want them. Okay, so practicing. My child is really naughty in practice. Uh, so this is one of the main things that parents find really hard is if the child is actually really misbehaving and then often that ends up in a big row and everyone ends up in tears and it sort of feels impossible and very much the opposite of, you know, sharing the joy of music with your child. So get yourself a practice chart. Establish a reward scheme with your child for seven good practices. Offer them something they won't get otherwise and that you know they really want. We recommend experiences over objects. A trip to a city farm is way more plastic, way more fun than yet another plastic toy, but go with what you know will work. The seven practices don't need to be in a row and your child will get a sticker for practicing even if they're naughty during those practices. However, they will only get the main reward when you get to seven well-behaved practices in total. It might take a few weeks or even months if things are really bad, but don't worry, you will get there eventually. Make sure you are clear about your expectations and read the rest of the practicing help section on this site. Naughtiness is generally about something else, so expect a lot of overlap with the other topics listed here and try to work out which one is the root cause of the problem. So for example, if we think about the one that we just read about focus, the child may be being really naughty because they feel things are too difficult and they can't do it, and so therefore they resist even trying. They might feel that they are trying really hard but they're not having their efforts noticed and therefore they, what's the point if they're not feeling, you know, rewarded and in terms of like behavior, emotionally rewarded for making a big effort. Uh, they might be really tired, you know, dad might be thinking, oh, it's 20 past seven, let's just squeeze in 10 minutes practice before dinner at 7.30 with a five-year-old, that's generally not gonna work. Um, you know, the parent might be on their mobile phone a lot uh, or trying to make dinner at the same time as breakfasting, all of these things that are kind of unconscious communications to the child that, they're not worth the parent's undivided attention are very likely to then end up with the child being naughty because it's kind of rude, right? 
Um, but all of that is an unconscious response, probably in both people. So how do I use the practice chart? <laughs> Give your child a gold star for practices in which there is only good behaviour. And please make sure that parents understand that this is not only good playing the violin. They might be making some really serious mistakes in the violin, but if the behaviour is good, that's what they are being rewarded for. It's not a perfect practice as if you've suddenly transformed a child who's being naughty into like a, you know, wonderling. A silver star for a reasonably good practice and a blue or whatever colour you choose star for a practice that gets done despite naughtiness. That way you can praise them for doing practice even if it's with some naughtiness, but also really track the good practices. Alter it to suit your circumstances. If you think seven is too many to aim for initially, start with three. If you feel that the most you can expect right now is a silver star practice, offer them a reward for seven silver stars with an extra bonus for any gold stars they earn. There are no rules about this, so go ahead and make up your own. Does everyone kind of understand what that would like look and feel like so far? Yeah, cool. Um, are they showing this <coughs> to you, or are they reporting back to you? Yeah. Uh, what do I do when my child is actually being naughty? Try to get one step ahead of your child. Talk to them about how nice it would be to have a cooperative practice, how good they will feel if they do well, and how proud their teacher will be to hear that practice is improving. Make sure they have eaten and drunk something, that they are not too tired, and that you are in a good mood. Start a rainbow system with your child. We've already talked about that. It will help to have a colour picture of a rainbow to hand, even a hand drawn one will do. Just ensure that green is in the middle of the rainbow. Use a counter and start them on green and move them up through the colours if they do well. If they are naughty, move them down through blue towards violet and tell them they can work their way back towards green again. Warn them before moving down, but just move them up every time you feel they deserve it. If you stay on violet for more than five minutes, end the practice, put them on the naughty step and tell them they can try again tomorrow. Blah, blah, blah. We'll talk about the naughty step in a minute. Make sure your demands are reasonable and praise your child often for the things they are doing well, as in the behaviour that they are doing well. I should rewrite this and make it clearer. Try to give them as much control as you can without letting them run all over you and ensure that you are giving them more attention for good behaviour than you are for poor behaviour. So who could give me an example of giving a child as much control as you can without letting them run things? What might that look like if a parent said, what does this mean? I don't really know what, it, what you should do. Uh, so an example would be like letting the child choose from a few options, like what they want to practice. Exactly. Would you like to do your five bow holds now, or your five stop the traffic now, or would you like to play mini at one, or two, or three now, or you know? But not uh, how how much longer should we practice for, or you know? I want to do my violin practice in the bath. <laughs> like actually, Teddy has done some practice in the bath, but not with any water in it. <laughs> so you know, <coughs> I think it's quite helpful, and many parents find it quite difficult to let the child be as silly as they can without it being a problem. Like, so yeah, why shouldn't a child stand in a dry bath and do their practice? There's absolutely no reason why not. They can stand and do their practice on the toilet if they want. But because it's silly, like many adults will just be like, no, just be sensible, come on. And it's like, you have to keep asking yourself and asking your parents to keep asking themselves, well, why do I want them to be sensible? Like, they're already doing this very sensible thing, which is learning the violin. We can make it as silly as we can in other ways. Yeah, you want to do your practice in a pirate outfit? Sure, what's the problem? But it's like, I think for parents, adults who are not very in touch with their kind of silly side, it can be very difficult to practice actually saying yes whenever possible and working out really rationally where the no line should be and not just know that's silly so we're not going to do it. A similar thing about like, you're going to do this because I've asked you to rather than for any good reason. If you think the root cause of your child's bad behaviour is that they don't want to learn their instrument, work out what you can do to inspire them. Take them to a concert, show them clips on this site and the web, discuss the negative effects of giving up, both in terms of missing group lessons and concerts, generally the most popular part of the learning process, and also what it means to quit on something. In the end, you have to choose between gritting your teeth and getting through a rough patch, everyone gets through it sooner or later, but it's no fun while you're in it and letting your child give up. <coughs> this is an individual choice and depends very much on your motivation for starting your child in the first place. If you do think your child should give up, please talk to your teacher or other director about it before you let them decide. So some parents come to us with a three-year-old and are like, my child will play the violin. And in, that, in their mind, what they mean is, my child will play the violin until they're 18. 
most parents come to us, my child would like to play the flute or whatever, and you know, when it gets difficult, they have different responses to whether the child wants to quit. And then some people come and they won't even have one band practice with the child when they say they want to quit, that's it, immediately. And obviously, our role is to try and encourage people towards, like we're going to talk about through Christine Goodness, um, to, uh, beyond the music lesson, towards this being a choice. Like in our family, this is what we do. In other families, they do things differently. But you know, <clears throat> I think um, it makes a huge difference psychologically to the children that have a very clear understanding of that this is just what we do. This, like, yeah, you can say that you want to give up, but it's like brushing your teeth. Versus, you know, this is a hobby that I've chosen. When I choose a different one, my parents will just let me make the choice to to change over. Um, but also, you know, we have to be compassionate towards parents who do let their kids quit because sometimes they just don't have the bandwidth. The parents just don't have the emotional fortitude to keep going through, you know, if it's a really long, really rough patch. I can completely understand that you might be like, oh, shit, I just don't have it in me to fight with you anymore. Okay. And, you know, the, the, the adults that I meet a lot of who say, I can't believe my parents let me give up, you know, and I kind of say, have you, like... Have you tried to make a 12 year old, for example, do something that they really don't want to do for more than a year? It's really rough. Like, don't just blame it all on your parents. You do have to take some responsibility yourself. Um, How would you approach that conversation in like the initial consultation lessons being like, I need to get this them to read to Christine's way. book. Okay. And then have a talk about, you know, reading the book or doing parent education classes, something like that, where you have an opportunity before there's a problem. If you wait until there's a problem, many parents will feel attacked if you bring up the problem. Whereas if you say, it's almost 100% guaranteed that you will hit a point at, during this journey where it's really difficult between you and your child. It would be great if you could think about how you would like to respond to that now. What I recommend is that you don't treat it as something that should make you decide to stop, but that you, you decide ahead of time this is how I'm going to respond to that, i.e. I'm going to ask for help from my students, uh, from my teachers. I'm going to, you know, take a long-term view and say to a child, if they're saying they want to give up, okay, uh, I'm not saying that I'll never let you give up, but we're definitely going to do this until Christmas or until Halloween or until your birthday or like some, you know, several months ahead and then put all your energies into fixing that problem during that time. Um, and I think, you know, this is the, this is the crucial bit Playing music is fun, and if your child is not getting the fun from it, there are lots of things you can change before you change whether they do it or not. If you didn't get paid for going to work, the chances are you wouldn't do it. <laughs> Lucky you if you would do it for free but don't have to. Your child cannot see the long view of learning to play an instrument, so practice is like work to them. Don't pay them in cash, obviously, although for teenagers I think that can work. Um, but do make sure there are enough benefits to make it worthwhile for them until they play well enough to do it for the love of music. It's a long road before you get to that stage. I would say probably 10 years in, in most circumstances. Um, so be prepared. Make practices enjoyable in every way that you can. Offer appropriate rewards and tell your child that one day they will be like the big kids on the videos, but only if they keep plugging away at it. The only children who fail to succeed with the Suzuki method are those whose parents allow them to give up. If you do let them stop, that's fine as long as you're doing it for the right reasons. If it's because it's too hard or they don't enjoy their lessons or they don't like practice, all these things can be changed and then they will still learn to play beautiful music which is the gift we intend to give them why do you think it's so long before if it's 10 years that seems mad that seems too long uh i don't mean that there aren't things that they will do for the pleasure of doing those things in between starting and 10 years mm. i mean to the point where you can expect that they will do everything that you ask them to do even the bits they don't really want to without extraneous rewards um, because they see how the whole picture of you've got to practice this shift 15 times and you've got to do this study and you've got to do those scales and you've got to do that side reading and that will mean that you can learn the concerto and A minor properly um, until all of that is kind of fully understood I think an average of 10 years sometimes it's much quicker um, but I think to to develop the skills of self-control and discipline to the point where you'll make yourself do the things you don't want to do because you see the long-term benefits. To have got to a good enough playing stage where 
you can play the pieces that you, kind of pieces that you want to play, that you realise that, frankly, that you're better than most other people, like not your age, but you know, by the time you're a 14 year old, if you're in the Suzuki world, you are one of the older ones amongst our, you know, 10 years of lesser age students. Um, and often, you know, the orchestra that they might be in in school, at secondary school, or, um, you know, a band that they might do is probably not going to be massively rewarding musically as well as everything else. It'll probably either satisfy a musical need or satisfy a social need. It's quite unusual to get all of those in one go. And I think often by the time they're 14, 15, that is when they can kind of find those things that basically because they've got to the level of being so excellent at playing that all of those things can come together. But I don't mean that they will hate every moment of practice until Tony's time. I just mean until you can be like, okay, you go and do practice because you want to play the violin. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any thoughts? Questions? Obviously there's quite a lot of overlap to what we just talked about. most parents are not going to read all of them, most parents are going to read the one that applies to them and therefore there's a big overlap. So I think, obviously this is a lot of stuff that we've already talked about, but I think I do think having a 10 minute, a 5 minute and a 1 minute warning is really helpful. Uh, what I don't think I did put in there, but it's kind of implicit, is like offering a reward for starting is a really good thing. We often, if I've got a child who's resistant to actually starting, but then it tends to be okay once they've started, which is often the case, you know, on the reward, on the practice chart we'll just put another column in and they'll get the gold, silver, or red, or whatever star for how quickly they've come and they've been asked to, and like how, how good they've been about starting, basically. <coughs> I think, um, you know, do emphasize with the parent this thing that we were talking about quite a lot a minute ago. Don't give a child a sticker in order to make them stop messing about, inappropriate reward. Give them one when they actually do stop, stop messing about. Um, and uh, <coughs> I think often if the practices are not going easily, a good way a good way to help the parent get through it is to be like, okay, let's do fifteen minute practices. That's not fifteen minutes of practice. That's fifteen minutes time, and you get in as much as you can. Um, and then 
it really helps a lot if the parent can do this thing of like the, the you know you're hopefully having a good time the stopwatch goes off and it's really tempting to be like should we just make it you know should we just play one more piece but actually if you really emphasize to the parents how helpful it is for them not to do that to be like i would love to hear you play one more piece but we've got to stop because kate said or you know how said or whoever um only 15 minutes and for the child to be like i really want to play like you were again and like either be like no we're gonna put the violin away otherwise we'll be in trouble with your teacher or like okay but like make it a secret don't let them you know don't let them find out i've been letting you practice extra like those things can be immensely helpful in you know the next time they come to practice and over the time you know in the next few practices whereas you can be having a great time and you, the stopwatch can go off and the child thinks, brilliant, we finished. And the parent says, I'm having such a nice time, why don't you just play two more pieces? Instant meltdown, like, no, that's really not, that, that is, you know, don't move the goalposts, it's really not allowed. Good. So, last thing, questions to ask parents. So this is from our parent-teacher chat, so this is a kind of pre cheat sheet. But I think also this, these are the questions that I kind of try to keep on a bit of a rotor each few weeks so that I feel like I have a good understanding of how practice is at home, not just how many times have you practiced, how many times have you listened, which is the basic thing that I'm asking every week. How are you feeling about fitting practice and listening into your routine? So, you know, you might have a parent who's had a 7-7 certificate for getting practice and listening done every day. But then you might actually realise that what they've done is one piece in one box every day and listen to three pieces on the recording. Um, so, you know, just about kind of just digging in a bit deeper into what's actually happening. How is the mood between you and your child when you practice together? Are there any points of conflict which always kick off bad feeling or an argument? I think that's really helpful for us to know because, for example, oh, it's always sight reading. They, they hate sight reading. Okay. Where are you putting it in the order of practice? Are you leaving it until the end when the child is tired and wants to finish and they don't see why sight reading is useful? Like, you know, you say to a child who's on ring at one, they can play all their pieces by ear. Now you've got to work out what this random bunch of notes that don't even make a decent tune are on the page, how they're playing the violin. You know, like, it's, it's not helpful to them, but we, again, can see the long-term importance of doing sight reading. So, do it second in practice, you know, is it too difficult? Maybe they need to go back a grade or a book, maybe they need to do easier stuff, maybe you need to revisit the games um, that are the underpinnings of sight reading, which maybe we'll talk about in two weeks' time. Um, <coughs> you know, that, 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 that third question is really, really helpful. Is there anything you want to ask me away from your child? Like, how can I stop them, you know, whatever, running off the map? For example, uh, is there anything I talk about that you don't understand? Now, of course, if your pa the parents of your students are not musicians, there'll be millions of things that you talk about that they don't understand. But in terms of anything that you think, I think you know what you're supposed to do, and you're sitting there thinking, yeah, all fine, great. Apart from that one, but I just don't want to bring it up now, you know. And then, do you have any requests for how I teach or set practice at home? Like, you know, I've had parents say to me, well. Yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd set these things every week and I, I sit there and smile, but I always know that we're only going to get a third of them done. And I'm like, okay, well, that's really helpful to know because then I will, you know, reassess what I can set you um, or talk to you about how if you only do two things every practice, it's actually not going to serve you in your hope that your child will become a musician um, over time. Uh, and, and the other questions. And then obviously there are lots of other questions you may want to keep in the mix. And there'll be some specific ones that come up for a while and then not, you know, like if you've got a child who's not doing very much listening, you'll focus on that until they get, you know, into the groove, until the parent gets into the groove of setting, of doing the listening more often. Does that all make sense? Good. Uh, let's have a comfort break and at 10 to we'll just do some playing. Yay! Yay. Yeah. That's what we're here for. As well as all the other stuff. <laughs>
There are some in the kitchen. 